this, who's this for? Oh, John. Is John here? Oh, he's. Okay. He's All right, someplace. folks. We're on the air this evening, and I want to welcome everyone. I'll call the meeting to order. And would you like to join us in the pledge of allegiance to the flag? Everyone's raring to go for that. <laughs> That's because it's Veterans Day week. <laughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, all right, Mary, roll call. Collins? Here. Johnson? Here. If you see Here. Coburn? Here. Canopa? Here. And Johnson is excused. Okay, all right. Um, first on our agenda is the proclamation this evening. And this is the Albany Charitable Toy Run for December 1st, 2013. Whereas the Association for Motorcyclists of Oregon has been sponsoring a toy run since 1984 to gather together members of motorcycle groups, car clubs, and interested individuals to provide toys to needy families. And whereas there are families with children in the Albany area that will not enjoy a full Christmas due to financial hardship. And whereas a group of people continuing the tradition of having the annual toy run because of all the good work and fellowship. And whereas businesses and groups around the area help to sponsor the toy run such as the Eagles, Kmart, Minuteman Press, Road Maggots, Christian Motorcycle Riders, and the Cutting Room. And whereas on December 1, 2013, the toy run and parade will again be conducted with a gathering at the Kmart parking lot and a ride to the Eagles Lodge for gift distribution and lunch. Now therefore, I, Sharon Canopa, Mayor of the City of Albany, do hereby proclaim de December 1, 2013 as the Albany Charitable Toy Run Day and urge all citizens of Albany to recognize that day as a time of sharing and giving by motorcyclists and others and to be aware of their motorcycles on our streets and highways while they ride to provide a happier holiday season to families and children. In witness whereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the City of Albany to be affixed this 13th day of November 2013. This is a wonderful event. We've mentioned this for quite a few years, and um, Bill Root is here, and he's um, a part of organizing the event. But there is several hundred kids there that see this huge pile of toys brought in on a stage, and they're very, everyone's, very, every child is just attentive, very anxious, waiting, and um, they're just eyeing those toys, and it's a wonderful, fun event for them. And um, and I really appreciate all the hard work that everybody does for providing the toys for for the um, children in our community. But did you want to say a few words, Bill, on the event? Or yeah, I, I I'll give you a little bit. Um, the event, the time. parade will start at 11 o'clock at the Kmart parking lot. There we'll have a lady that does karaoke. So if you like to hear Christmas music or like to sing it, come on down. Um, the, uh, the parade this year, besides the motorcycles we're going to have, we're inviting a lot of the uh, car clubs. So uh, we're hoping to have a good selection of uh, antique and classic cars in the parade as well. Um, we'll have uh, the uh, uh, street next to the Eagles. <laughs> Alban. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's yeah. going to be blocked off between second and or first and water, mm -hmm. and for parking for the motorcycles. So they'll be parking in there. Um, lunch will be provided for those that uh, participate at the Eagles. The Eagles always do a good job of giving us uh, lunch put on by the Eagles Eagles Auxiliary, and uh, then we distribute toys. <laughs> well, Santa Claus is going to be there. <laughs> It's so. a great event, and all the motorcycles, most of them decorate their motorcycles up, too. Yeah, know, we, we have no four or 500 motorcycles that will be in the parade, yeah. and, and we'll have one of the uh, uh, fire department uh, apparatus leading the parade for us. Oh. Mm -hmm. It goes from Kmart parking lot down across Pacific, down to Salem Avenue, down Main Street to Water, and then Water all the way over to the Eagles. So. It'd be fun. Yep, it's a great event. So yeah, yeah. thank great you so event. much, Bill, for or organizing it. So tell yeah. us the date again. I'm sorry. Tell us the date. December first. 
Yeah. So, uh, December 1st, <laughs> Sunday. It's always the first Sunday in December. Yeah. And, and this year I see that the uh, Twice Around Parade is the same day. Normally it was a week later, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's that evening. So, yeah. Yep, yeah, perfect. It'll be a fun day downtown. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next scheduled business is business from the public. And Patty, I think you wanted to come forward this evening. I do. I do. Thank you, Mayor Canopa. I'll sit down. Yeah. I'm a little tired. <laughs> <laughs> For those that, that don't know me, I'm Patty Louisiana. I'm the chairperson of the Albany Veterans Day Parade, the uh, president of the Veterans Commemoration Association. And I'm just here to say to the city councilors, the mayor, and everyone that on the city that helped, thank you very much. Thank you for allowing us to shut down the roads for a few hours in Albany and put on a wonderful parade. I notice, because we always walk at the very end of the parade, I notice, and every year, the spectators wait until the very end. But even I was taken aback. There were five deep on the sidewalk. There were families. There was the World War II grandfather and the entire family around them. And that's, to me, what the parade's all about. We organize it. We bring in um, a lot of wonderful people to assist with the aligning of the parade. We have Home Depot employees. We had Hewlett Packard employees. We have aligned parade aligners that come over from them that have done the Strawberry Festival for years. So we have a wonderful crew that puts on the parade and organizes it. But it's the citizens and it's the individuals that step up and do the absolute wonderful floats. Um, we had a Elmer Flight float this year with Honor Flight recipients, and everyone just stepped up. And that's, to me, what it's all about, and just honoring the veterans. And it was wonderful. So I am just here to say thank you very much. The count was 340 motorcycles, not 2,000, not 600, 340. Um, the parade gets off right at 11 o'clock. Um, the parade last entry got on at 1.10, um, a little later than I normally like, but I think everybody was having such a good time down the road that they were stopping and talking to people. So we'll kind of get that going a little bit more last year, but my, um, I like to have it on the road before um, 1 o'clock. But other than that, it was a great day, and I hope everyone came out and watched it and just really enjoyed themselves. It was wonderful, Patty, and um, but I'm curious, how many volunteers does it take to put on when it comes to being at that ground level to um, put it's, it It's It's close to 100 now. Wow. It really is, in, in many different aspects of what uh -huh. they do, from announcing to set up to the actual alignment to the check-in, and we have three different check-ins. Um, so everyone is starting to just really come back every year. And so we have great, great liners and check-in people, stagers set up. And so it's not a burden on just a few. People are really looking forward to they come back every year. We know they're going to be coming back. Yeah, isn't it just wonderful? I mean, all of us, when we were riding in the parade, we kept saying, this is so many more people than last year. And it, it was like double. I mean, when you were saying it was five deep, it was you know, they were almost at times, you know, from the past the, the sidewalk, mm -hmm. you know, still mm -hmm. another, you know, four rows of people back uh -huh. there. It was ja just it, jammed. It might have yeah. been that it was a Monday and for a yeah. three-day weekend. Mm -hmm. um, there could have been a number of things, but I think that the word has gotten out that Albany does a wonderful Veterans Day parade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I kept being asked today, what makes you, you know, continue to say biggest you know, biggest west of the Mississippi, what is that keyed on? Is it number of entries? Is it, you know, spirit? I said, well, I think it, the phrase was coined years ago, and no one has proved us wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when, when Jim Barrett, uh, the story I've always heard is someone called up and said, well, we do a Veterans Day parade. We are on the west side of Mississippi, and we also have a great parade. And he said, well, okay. Prove that you're bigger. Or do you do this, 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 this? And he never heard from him again. Uh -huh. So I welcome anyone to say they do it bigger. Um, I, I'm sure that they might think, but we had 219 entries, six smaller than la uh, less than last year, only six, but they were bigger. Usually it's the fire department has three or four entries. We have the Albany Fire Department, all these other fire departments. They went together this year. 
And um, so when I saw the entry and I thought, oh, it'll be, you know, they said one or two. And then I called up the fire department to ask, well, I don't have your application. I want to make sure that you get it in. I, I will hold a spot. And they said, oh, no, we're already in the parade. We're going with, the, you know, the Lynn Benton Fire Department entries. And I thought, well, okay, we'll find a road. But because obviously, and I think there were 10, 10 fire trucks in that one entry. So those are the things that we saw. Instead of just a car, we had a semi. Instead of just one or two fire, depart, uh, fire trucks, it was, you know, eight to ten. So that's why every entry was bigger and larger. And um, it was exciting to see because we see the entries. And I'm the last aligner that puts everybody onto the parade route. But even I am pleasantly pr surprised to see what folks come up with because it just makes the parade. Oh, yeah. It truly does. Mm -hmm. It does. So, again, thank you for letting us block mm -hmm. the streets and I think you have, have a day every Girl Scout and Boy Scout and the whole region and the whole valley I just it's all about amazed. the kids it's, it's all about the wonderful. future it's it's yeah. celebrating our veterans and it's also bringing the kids into you know that's what it's all about it's their grandfathers it's it's their uncles their dads and moms so uh -huh. yeah that's what it's all about yeah well we are very fortunate <coughs> though Patty to have you because since you have taken over managing this you have done a fantastic job so oh, well, thank it's you just very very organized I never hear anything negative about our parade it's always very positive how professionally it is run so well that's our goal every year job. to get it on off yeah. the parade route very mm -hmm. little accidents yeah. um, without you know too many too many issues that come up but everyone just knows to watch out and everyone knows to be safe yeah. and that's that's the beauty of it and it's mm -hmm. honoring the veterans and that's why we have the motorcycles out front one, for safety reasons, but two, to let them clear the road. To have motorcycles in the parade, we would have a lot of hot engines. We would probably have a lot of broken down motorcycles. So again, we have them out front, let them have their glory. Besides the Patriot Guard riders, they're the ones that honor our soldiers as they come home, as they are deployed. Oh, that's and that's wonderful. an appropriate place for them. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. I won't yeah. take up any, any more of your any time. Any questions? So. No. no. I do have a comment. Uh, uh, I'm not a veteran myself, mm -hmm. but uh, one of my brothers is. He got drafted during the uh, Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Then he went to Vietnam and he came back and uh, uh, encountered a public who was very negative to the mm -hmm. war, very negative to mm -hmm. uh, veterans. Uh, and um, uh, after a while, uh, he and his family moved to Salem and mm -hmm. we invited him to come down and see our parade mm -hmm. and he said to me you know this is the first time I felt good about my military mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. so very much in favor of this parade from that standpoint too. if you see any of my articles or any of uh, the publications or comments that I make I am always saying welcome them home because this is might be the first time they are welcomed home and this is what I have heard time and time again and I have seen so many veterans that truly it is very healing to them. We might take the words welcome home and thank you for your service for granted. They take it to heart because they might not ever have heard that. I think there are a lot of our veterans that mm -hmm. need all the help they can get these mm -hmm. days. And Absolutely. The difficulty in being employed and terrible stuff that they've seen. It is. It is. Um, and this is why, though we put on the parade, I really feel that the, the town is embracing it more and more. And so bringing in veterans organizations, bringing in the advocacies, and this to me is what the Veterans Day should be, not just the parade. We'll put on the parade for a few hours. And then if you've ever been on the streets of downtown Albany an hour after the parade is gone, it's just like an average day. But the spirit's still there. And the spirit is at the American Legion, it's at uh, the Eagles, they open their doors, but different places, uh, the restaurants, but different places that advocacies can happen and pulling veterans together. And uh, that's what my hope in the future, it just continues to grow and um, things like that do happen for veterans, especially they getting them, you know, any help that they do need. Thank you for doing that. You bet, it's my pleasure. That's why I do it because my son and daughter are also in the military. My son has done four deployments and my daughter too. Though I've been doing parades for a number of years, it's always been supporting the veterans. So I do understand. But thank you very much.
We only shut down the roads one day a year, and it's a lot of fun, but thank you. Good job at you it. Bet. So, thank you, Patty, so much. That was just a wonderful success. So, yep, we're proud of it. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone from business from the public? Okay, all right. Okay, um, on tonight's agenda is a second reading of ordinance regarding planning file VC0113, vacation of a private easement. The applicant is Coastal Farm and Home Supply. And the ordinance is on page five of your agenda. And second reading? I'll make a motion the ordinance be read a second time and title only. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Oops, Aye. Aye. No Aye. second time. Is there a discussion? No discussion? Okay. All this an, let me read it then. Yeah. This is an ordinance vacating an access easement on lot one of the Coastal Farm Subdivision Plat, Lynn County Survey Number 23139 in Albany, Oregon, adopting findings and declaring an emergency. We'll make a motion for adoption of the ordinance. Second. Okay, now discussion. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. All right, next is a resolution. This is on page 17. And this is including <laughs> exemption from the competitive bidding process for the purchase of one low floor bus through an existing interstate cooperative contract with Stark Area Regional Transit Authority. So, Mark? So we're yeah we're seeking an exemption and you'll you'll see actually another one here also for another piece of equipment and the use of these large regional purchasing um, I don't know, for lack of a better term agencies or, or groupings uh, there's several advantages for the city one is we don't have to go through the the time and expense of putting together all the specifications and everything uh, and going out to bid evaluating those bids. <coughs> that's already been done. Secondly, uh, we have quite a cost savings for the city because as uh, companies bid uh, in these large regional um, purchasing agreements, you get better prices because they know they're gonna have multiple sales or have the opportunity for multiple sales. And so uh, in order for us to take advantage of that, we do have to have the council um, approve the exemption uh, for this purchase for the bus um, most of uh, the cost of the bus all but 17 percent is paid for by a grant the city matches that 17 percent and that uh, purchase was uh, budgeted in this year's budget question you know how long <coughs> excuse me how long it's been since the, the stark bidding process occurred I do not know no Barry does, though. Barry, would you like to come forward? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm uh, Barry Hoffman, the Transit Program Supervisor. Uh, the, that was a 2008 uh, cooperative uh, bid that they did. So we're actually taking advantage of prices from 2008 they put a little um, I escalator. escalator per year. So we actually saved quite a bit by using this rather than going on a newer bid. This one's towards its end. I believe it expires in April. So it's the last of a couple of options for, for this contract. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, Bill. Barry, I was just looking at the uh, letter from the manufacturer. 16 month delivery, <laughs> huh? Yeah. Wow. That's pretty normal in the bus business. It's a 16 to 18 month bid. Sometimes they can, or a build, sometimes they can slide a bus in between. There's places that are buying thousands of buses, 2,000 buses, and so mm -hmm. they'll slide up one of our buses in between and, and be able to get it out faster, but uh, for most purposes, it's 15 to 18 months is what they quote. Okay. Yeah. Great. And the price stays remains the same even though it's a year and a half later. Or is there? Yeah. A uh, based on the on the quote they gave us uh, from a few months ago. August. Yeah. August. August exactly. Yeah. yeah. More than one company that makes this kind of bus. There are. Uh, 
There, I think there's four big bus manufacturers in the country. Gillig, New Flyer. Now you're going to put me on the spot. <laughs> but there's, there's about four large... The question is, yeah. uh, do they all have this mass bidding situation? They like do. You look at a variety of buses and uh, see which one you like and then get in on this kind of a deal? Yeah, they do. Yep. I would say Gillig is kind of the large... Call the big boys on the block as far as uh, city transit buses go. New Flyer does a lot of the uh, articulated buses that you might see in Eugene. Uh, I don't think Gillick makes any of those. So they kind of have their niche, but yeah. So you can kind of pick and choose what kind of bus you're going to get and then get on one of these That's right. bandwagons, I get I call them. Purchase. Yeah, more or less. Mm -hmm. So this is replacing an existing bus that's going out of service, or is it being trashed, or what happened to So the two of our buses are at 600,000 miles and over uh, 12 years old, which puts them at their end of their lifespan, uh, two of the loop buses. We, uh, what we'll most likely do is, is take this new bus, put it into daily service, so it'll go into daily service pretty much right away as soon as we have it ready to go. <clears throat> We have two other buses. One is a 95 Gillig. Uh, actually runs pretty good. It's, it's, it's a pretty good bus. We'll probably put it off to the side, let it be the backup to that bus. Uh, then we'll have another Gillig that, uh, that we, could, we could dispose of a bus, send it down the river, so to speak. Uh, I, we haven't really decided if we're going to hang on to both of those spares. Uh, because uh, <laughs> when you run one, you have to have a spare because you go uh, oil changes, breakdowns, things happen. And then uh, for a future expansion, if we want to expand the loop service, we'll need to have a spare for that too. So we can keep them running for a while. The oldest bus we have is a, a 91 Gillig. Uh, and that one, when we get this new one, it's actually a spare ATS bus. and we. We try not to use it all. You've probably seen it. it's a little short little green one that goes around occasionally. Haven't really used it much in the past couple of years. That one will probably, quote unquote, go down the river when this new one comes in. It'll en enable us to shuffle buses around and use them differently. So that spare bus and the shorter green one, um, since that's more out of our transit budget, can it be utilized, say, for backup for tourism? Um, you know, bus system for within the parks department? That's a good question. It would have to be, uh, it depends on how it was purchased originally, it, whether it was purchased with FTA money or city money. And, yeah. and uh, the, at, at some point, the FTA releases its hold on vehicles. And that one, that 1991 bus, probably would. Uh, but I, I don't know if anyone would want it, quite honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I don't know what it really looks like, but I'm just thinking, you know, where we put the wrap on our other buses, but the parks department, it's just, it's a great outreach for tourism. And, but even when we um, have events going from, from the expo, bringing, you know, use, utilizing the trolley and bringing people, sure. you know, to restaurants throughout town, mm -hmm. if, if even our art and air festival, things like that. Yeah, the, yeah. Pro the, the difficulty with that bus in particular mm -hmm. is that it was, uh, it's, it's called a spirit bus. Uh, Gillig Spirit bus, and it was only made for like a year before they discontinued that model. They started a model, built this huge factory, made them for a year, and then closed it down. Oh, wow. It just didn't work. I think the factory was in Texas somewhere. So finding parts for that oh. vehicle in particular is is really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, motor parts not too bad, but body, uh, uh, electrical, it, it's really hard to find parts for that one. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, interesting. I was just curious because it just seems like we're we're getting a lot of events, you know, really going to be having the demand for, you know, more of the shuttle-type buses for Absolutely. events. But, yeah. Okay. Council Floyd? Uh, just to comment that the, the local match is coming from our equipment reserve, and <clears throat> that's one of the things that we do well, I think, is take our rolling stock and build those reserves so they annually, annually we don't have to take a, a large hit in the operating budget it spread over time that's correct I, I appreciate having equipment reserve for things like this and the next item also <clears throat> okay. questions now you have a resolution in front of you 
Move adoption of the resolution on page second. 17. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. All right. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. <coughs> and next is another exemption from the competitive bidding process. So, Mark, this item is a resolution on page 26. Correct. And this is for one of our large uh, jet vacuum sewer cleaner trucks. They used to clean out the sanitary sewers, manholes, storm drains, at times used for hydraulic excavation. So these, uh, this piece of equipment is something that's used uh, pretty much every day uh, that we're in business. Uh, it's an important piece of equipment. As you can see, it's, it's fairly expensive. We're replacing a 12-year-old um, Vactor. The difference with this uh, from the bus, we are asking that you declare the existing vector as surplus property so that we can use that as a trade-in and get about $51,000 uh, off the purchase price of a new vector. Questions? Yeah, Floyd, and then Ray. Just for the record, make sure that people understand, we're not exempting competitive bidding. We're exempting the competitive bidding process because the items have all been competitively bid by other agencies, and we're just taking advantage of that. That's correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mark, uh, the one that we're going to be using as a trade-in, it's not functional enough to keep it as a backup or as a secondary unit to be utilized simultaneously? Or No, I think the, the, there's more value in the trade-in, and we have two uh, so this is a replacement. So we do have oh, okay. uh, two, uh, so we'll still have a backup, so to okay. speak. Uh, they're both used extensively. Okay. Okay, Bill. What's the delivery on this piece of equipment, do you know? Three months. Just in time for spring. <laughs> yeah. We need to use it now for <laughs> getting all the leaves out of the, <laughs> out of the storm drains, but... Yeah. Okay, Council, there is a resolution on page 26. What would you like to do with that item? Move adoption of the resolution on page 26. Second. All right, any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. And I forgot one piece to read here from our VC 0113 vacation of a private e easement. The applicant was um, Coastal Farm. So the vote was unanimous. If the ordinance passes, within five days of the, de of the decision, the community development director provides written notice of the decision to the applicant and any other parties entitled to notice. A decision of the city council may be appealed to the land use board of appeals by filing a notice of intent to appeal not later than 21 days after the decision becomes final. Okay, that was finishing up that item. Next is adoption of the consent calendar. Any items that you would like to have pulled off? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion for adoption of the consent calendar. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. And uh, next is appointing Courtney Hall to the Community Development Commission. And this was the item that was carried forward. And, um, and Catlin got a hold of Courtney and she filled out the application. Was that? I appreciate her showing that out. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I can't see what ward she lives in. I guess I can tell Um her. She is ward three, though. Yeah. Okay. Move for approval. All right. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Okay. Motion carried. And next, um, Bob, I saw him making his way forward. This is the annual performance benchmarking report, citizen survey. I wonder if anybody has any questions. It's information on it. Okay. Any questions, Council? Well, you know, I think, it, I think it's a great thing that we're doing this because it means we're measuring something and tracking how well we're, how well or not so well that we're doing certain activities. I think one of the activities that we may not doing, be doing so well on is telling people what it is we are doing well on. We're not telling our story very well. And I would really like to find a way that 
people know that we are looking at these things. Our attempt is to get better and more efficient, and we measure ourselves against, against some performance standards, and we strive to improve to deliver the services. Yeah, we, you know, <clears throat> I, I think that is an issue, and, and, and that we face routinely in the city, and that, you know, we do uh, a newsletter now that has a pretty broad distribution. I think that was fairly well publicized not too long ago. Um, we, um, you know, we have a television station that has information on it. Most importantly, we have an incredible website which has access to information that, like I said, is if I'd have had that information 25 years ago as a young city manager, I would have done handsprings in terms of the ability to actually know what's going on in your organization and manage it. And now any citizen can get that information if they want it. The dilemma for us is how much resource do we invest in telling people all the wonderful things we're doing versus actually going out and doing the wonderful things, particularly when we're really strapped to be able to accomplish those tasks. Um, I mean, Bob has made no secrets. He's going to be gone here in six, eight months. And frankly, we probably won't fill that position. We, we have plans for how we'll deal with some of Bob's uh, functions, but he's kind of irreplaceable. He just brings a really unique skill set. And, um, and we're still, you know, and, and particularly with the performance measurement, it is still very much a work in progress where uh, I think we've done some really good things. I mean, I use the information. I, I was looking at it today. Just, you know, it's almost a daily event. We're all, and, and some of the reports that we're able to access now through our financial si reporting system are just really helpful in terms of being able to say, okay, uh, and we, you, in fact, you were looking at one of them. Floyd and I were looking at one just tonight where you can say, all right, this is where we were last year. This is where we were five years ago. How are we doing in comparison to that? What kind of signals does that send us? What kind of questions do we need to ask? And, you know, so there's, there's all these, again, incredible tools that anybody can look at online. Um, so long-winded response <laughs> to the question of what more do we do uh, in terms of getting our story out? And um, I don't have great answers for you. I, I mean, we can, Marilyn, I think, does a, a great job, but we have Marilyn not only serving as our public information officer, she's the head of our code squad, she serves on, she's been very, very active and involved in the, in the homeless issue. She does a little bit of everything for the city. And, um, uh, and we have Matt, who is our webmaster, who does, I think, an excellent job in terms of you know, keeping the content fresh and, and accessible and so on. Um, but if we were to really step up and ramp up um, uh, an effort to get out positive information or just information to the public, um, it would inquire, it would require an, an investment of, of more time and, and people. And you know, that's a that's a that's a tough choice. Well, you know, I appreciate you. Know, you are walking in and trying to balance effort and cost, and then ultimately result. But I think sometimes we have to step back and ask ourselves, so what's the response we're getting? And maybe some of the response we're getting is because people either aren't taking the time or they're not finding the right place to go to get the information that would be helpful. And I don't think it ever hurts to ask ourselves, are we doing it the way we should be doing it? And at what level are we doing it? So. Well, I, I think that's an excellent question. And, and, and just to reiterate some of the things we are doing that maybe people aren't as aware of, I mean, we're pretty active on social media accounts. We've, you know, we, we do Facebook, we do Twitter. I get my little Facebook. I, I'm, I, I'm a, I, I will publicly admit I'm a Facebook user. It's how, I, it's how I brag about my grandkids. I put pictures of my grandkids on. And I get my reports regularly, little announcements from the city on, um, you know, different things that are happening. And uh, so we're, we're doing that. We, we have, not, in addition to the cities, we have sort of departmental uh, um, units that have Facebook and Twitter accounts that they use and so uh, and of course we are you know we're televising all our meetings we're streaming live our, our meetings on, on, on video uh, there are a lot of ways for people to see what we're doing if they're interested um, I think we just compete and it's very difficult for us to compete in terms of information in a world where people are inundated they have many many choices about what information they choose to look at and plus, we're suspect, inherently suspect, 
uh, where, because we're government, when, when we put out information, uh, some people are going to label it as propaganda. And um, uh, so, uh, again, we rely on people like Hasso and, and uh, the, the DH to, you know, spread the word. And, and I, I really do think we've been generally very, I feel very fortunate uh, that we have had, uh, we've had good coverage uh, in, our, in our local media. But, um, uh, you know, we're open to suggestions. Marilyn and I were having this discussion this morning about, you know, what other things might we do. Um, Talk about it almost every day. Actually. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a subject of ongoing concern. How do we present accurate, honest information that is not propaganda? Um, and, and how do you get people interested enough to actually look at that information? You know, and, um, yeah, and, and I have thought about this, too, because it seems like the last couple years, you know, we have really taken, you know, quite a bit of criticism. And so whatever we're doing isn't quite enough. We still need to be able to somehow reach out and give that message out there. And I think, I think we could be able to use that tool with our, the TV station. We have kind of a, a valuable tool there that I think we could utilize more, even if it's just PowerPoint presentations taking place, really giving that message out there, a positive message. I mean, you look at everything that our parks and recreation does, our libraries. I mean, there's so many activities that I think we can really get that, get that message out and, um, the, and the amount of programs that we have. So I think it's something worth exploring to see can we get some interns in with the city that could be able to help, you know, enhance that TV program, put through some of the, um, you know, a, some sort of PowerPoint to it, some type of information. Um, and we have a very creative guy sitting right there that's very good with putting the text together on something like that of getting a message out. But um, I think there's, we, I think we have the tools here to be able to utilize, but whatever we're doing is somehow not quite enough. And I think we need to kind of step it up a bit and see what we can to really get more of that message to reach reach the citizens out there. Yeah. I think Rich was first, then Floyd, yeah. Yeah, well, this, this is an issue that I have long since um, had issues about. It's because, well, I've said it before, if you, you either give people the information the way they want to receive it or put up with them throwing rocks at you. And frankly, I've been here for, you know, 11 months and I haven't come up with any ways um, that, that I can think of so far to make it easier for people to get the information. And I guess I would point out, and, it, and it's been said, uh, make it a little more um, plain if there's somebody out there who has an idea about why don't you do this, that, or the other thing, you're going to have a whole lot of very willing ears here. Um, because, you know, we either get the information out there or put up with the trouble. And, you know, I don't want to put up with any more trouble than I have to. You know, my comment was really along the same lines, and that I know we do. We do a lot of posting of reports and information, but I think sometimes we post it in government speak, and we don't post it in terms of speaking to the, to the citizen in the community. And we, as we review that information, we need to ask ourselves, are they understanding what we're trying to say? Mm -hmm. And make sure we communicate that in a way that is understandable. Because if not, they'll just, after the first two paragraphs, they'll glaze over. And they'll just back away, and then they start throwing the rocks. So, not to be an excuse, but we need to we need to talk in non-government speak terms. You know, sometimes Stuart gives us a report, and he tells us, "Well, this is the way we got to have it for GFOA." Well, I really don't care. <laughs> you can have it in your pocket for GFOA. I just need to be able to explain it to people. Well, and we do, you know, one of the ways that we try and reach out, and we do it fairly routinely, are, you know, we'll, and I think this is, it's the more effective kind of communication is when you can actually go out to, like I was at the Optimist Club this last week, where, you know, I can have a, a dialogue with people. Mm -hmm. They can ask questions, and we can talk back and forth. And why did you put people do that? Well, you know, and you can explain things, and that, that works really well. But unfortunately, it reaches a fairly small group of people. And I think, too, 
things are different now than they were when I started as, as, as a city manager in the sense that, uh, you know, people don't join clubs like they used to. This, yeah. You know, the, the traditional, I mean, if you think about the election that we just had, you had a unanimous city council. Uh, the media was pretty unanimous. I mean, we had the endorsement of the newspaper. You had the unanimous endorsement of the Chamber of Commerce Committee. And so also. Uh -huh. Hasso had opined, I think, in favor in his blog, which I think he's still an influential voice in the community. So you had very public sources saying, yes, this is a reasonable plan, a reasonable thing to do, and yet folks still chose not to, to, to support it. Was that a lack of information, or was it because there's just some different values, and, and I think also the national mood right now toward government is not real popular. And, uh, and if you look around the state, it wasn't just Albany, it was most <coughs> places that were putting up, you know, bond measures for new construction didn't have a lot of luck. Um, school districts, other cities, um, you know, it was pretty, pretty grim. I mean, it, Corvallis barely passed their levy, which if you can't pass a levy in Corvallis, you know something's <laughs> weird is going on. So I, I guess all of that having been said, I, I would be glad to invest more of my time in trying to come up with some content. Um, you know, I have probably have more discretionary time than most, and I can, you know, try and produce some, like, things for, for the, for um, the, Marilyn's clearing at me thinking, you're really going to do this. I, I'm trying, thinking about finishing your sentence for you. Though, yeah, well, I, I think. Which I do all the time. Yes, I about think, that. you know, I could probably do, like, some PowerPoint presentations and more writing. I mean, I do a fair amount of that now, and I'm, I could probably increase that effort. So we'll, we will definitely try in response to what I know is a, a fair concern, is how do you get better information out to people that, uh, that they'll actually use and listen to. Yeah. You know, and I, I kind of did that Albany story that I um, did, you know, for the Oregon Merits Association on the PowerPoint, so we could, that's got a lot, 80 some slides to it that we could look at even to get some good visuals to have, um, you know, on, with, you know, with the contact added to it, so. Um, but I think there's, there's quite a bit out there that we could sort of utilize and, and um, anything I think would help, so. Bob's okay, anything else? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep, Bob. I just want to take one little opportunity to broaden the discussion a little bit with one observation. Everything you said is correct. Uh, Councilor Kellum, finding what people want is a really hard thing and a really important thing because if you don't give them what they want, they're not satisfied. But there's two pieces on this. One is articulating the story of what we've done and what we've done well and what we're proud of and also when we've messed up, why we've messed up and what the issue is. But the other issue is, and one that I really spend most of my time dealing with is, is what do we need internally as managers to manage the organization better? You know, what Wes has talked about, what we want to do is we want to make decisions based on what we know, not what we think. And that means being able to track things, to be able to find time, to understand where we can twist a nut here or move a slide there and make things work better. And that's a real internal kind of thing, not the kind of thing I think most people care about. They want to see the end result. We do need to get that end result uh, to them. And the truth of the matter is the last four years have been very hard as we get smaller and smaller and we still are trying to do everything we can and so we take all the steps we can one step at a time to try and make our internal systems better so we can bring up real information, real data. When you ask us why, we ought to be able to tell you for some certainty why and not why we think it might be what it is and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Wonderful. Put that all in text and we can put that on our TV channel. Okay. <laughs> it's Bob's on there right now, Mayor. <laughs> oh, is it? Of course. This is live. So, um, oh no, I mean, um, just as a regular slide going on oh, the TV channel. It. Yeah. So, where it's over and over, where somebody just wants to sit and relax and can They can watch this, this same council meeting um, every night at 7 until the next council meeting. <laughs> and in that ca in this case, th that's really a lot of exposure because there's not another council meeting until December. Yeah. Oh, well, then that'll be good. <laughs> I can see it now. Yeah. These people keep saying the same things every meeting. Exactly. I know. Yeah. Well, you know, just thinking, and we do this re sometimes on a recurring basis, but a lot of the things on our agenda are relatively routine in nature, 
but they're complex issues. Like when we, we do LID assessments or you know, we allow, allow people to finance uh, assessments over time, generally that's on our agenda and it's, there's a report that backs it up. They present all the relevant information and we adopt it without much discussion. But to the public, they see that getting done almost without comment and they wonder what the heck did those guys just do? And it's confusing and you know, it leads to an element, I think, of distrust as opposed to confidence. So we need, to, we need to take the time in our agenda process and say, you know, what we're currently doing is, and putting it in layman's terms so they understand, and it's pro forma, people can sign up, they can do this, they come to our counter, but provide some explanation. Well, yeah, I, I don't disagree, Floyd, but, you know, some of the, uh, the things that we keep, uh, of course, as staff marveling at, or at least I marvel at because it's such a change from the way things used to be, is that you can go online and pick up the whole agenda packet, the same information that the city council is getting, uh, you know, the Friday before a, a Wednesday council meeting, and there's full staff reports, there's maps, there's, you know, whatever you want to look at. Now, granted, those are very thick packets, and there's a lot of information in there, but, um, you know, they're there. And uh, you can even get, if you don't want to look at that, we do little executive summaries. You know, I do a little executive summary that's in those packages. and and. So, <laughs> you're back to, uh, I mean, yes, trying to put things in lay terms. Um, uh, and I think, for example, tonight we're talking about these two purchases. We had a pretty good discussion on why we're, you know, why we're re we, that we are using a competitive bid process, that we're just piggybacking in order to be more efficient and to try and do it better. Um, and I thought that was in pretty clear terms, but, you know. But it but depends on whether or not you are someone who is used to the competitive bid process. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're Joe Sixpack, um, you know, that may not be something you've done before or you've heard before. And so, you know, I mean, I recognize we went through um, reading of ordinances. And, of course, that's a piece of it tonight and a piece of it was last time. And it was explained last time, so everybody here tonight recognizes, yeah, we already talked about that. Only folks out there, they don't get that because, well, they may not have tuned in last time. Um, I don't know how to fix that. You know, I'm just... I have a suggestion. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm going to read this. This is the first one, and they're both the same. Approving exemption from the competitive bidding process for the purchase of... Well, could we write that to say, utilizing a competitively bid multi-agency contract in lieu of a local bidding process? Would that convey it a little clearer, possibly? Oh, no. no. <laughs> Why? In fact, I think it sounded worse. <laughs> Does it? Because it says right up that it was competitively bid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the point, though, isn't it? Coming up with some language that clarifies it makes it a little easier? Yeah, well, I, 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 I understand what you said, and I... You know, yes, it does to me, but, and I, and I want to say this carefully because I'm not trying to look down my nose at somebody. There are folks who, who, don't know. Yeah. who do not, well, they don't have as firm of grasp of the language. And so when you have a sentence with a bunch of big words, they don't get every, get it, you know, the first time through. Oh. Uh, just like... We all have those kinds of things that we're not good at. Um, I agree. Yeah. It's, it's well, Wes mentioned that he, you know, he has basically a synopsis, uh, and his, I think, was very succinct. Public Works also needs to purchase a new vacuum truck for the sewer system. Proposals to use another jurisdiction's competitive bid process to avoid the costs associated with creating a new bid process. That's that's clear, clearly. And that's available to anyone that wants to read it, but I, I freely acknowledge and recognize that, you know, most people aren't going to, they just don't want to take that time. And, and, and the packet is intimidating. I mean, even for this meeting where we had, you know, not a whole lot of business for the public, I, I didn't count the pages, but I'm sure the packet was, you know, 20 pages or more. 40, 30, 39, 40. So, so how many years have we been videotaping now? Six, seven. That's seven, I think. I think it's seven, seven. Because this conference 
this conversation is exactly what I had stated. I was hesitant towards us even going this route because I said, how are people going to really know what we are voting on? And so it's kind of funny. We're talking about this today, and that's exactly what um, our conversation was, whether to move forward to videotape. Because it is very, it is difficult if they don't have that agenda packet in front of them. Watching online is a creative way to do it because they can see the agenda packet while it's online, but watching it on TV, I knew it was going to well, be. I watch we could, yeah. we could project it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that would be, that could be one camera. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, but so but complicated I mean, though. Yeah, it just but so seven years ago, that's what we we had thought back then that it would be, you know, a little difficult. But but I mean, it's working. It's still I hear from people. It's very boring watching it on TV. But there are some that do still watch it. So. Well, in, in mm -hmm. March or April, when I was I was well, I was able to watch a good chunk of a of a city council meeting in Afghanistan. <laughs> so. I mean, yeah. It's yeah. pretty it's boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things, I, I routinely get a phone call from one of the local radio stations, either pre or post council meeting. You know, what's on the agenda? You know, what's the complexities of it? Or, or they'll call me afterwards and say, so what did you guys do tonight? Or what did you do with this issue? And maybe some form of preamble that says, you know, tonight's agenda is going to be inclusive of, and we simplify using Wes's summary. And at the end of the meeting, somebody sit down for five minutes and say, and here's what council did tonight. Uh, it kind of puts the bookends. Here's what we thought we were going to, what's on the agenda. We went through all the macerations of making it right. And here's what we ended up doing. And, you know, it, it may be one element of how we improve that. But I think if you can put it in terms that the people quickly understand, and I, I understand the issue about being able to look up. They can look up the agenda. But if they watch us on TV and they how many people, if they're confused, are going to go look up the packet to find out the information is just saying, there they go again. Well, and just well <laughs> the other thing, too, that we, we're, that is unique, I think, to some degree for a city of our size is the accessibility not only of the council. I mean, you folks are out in the community, and the mayor has <laughs> got to be the most accessible mayor of a city of this size anywhere. Um, I mean, I get calls every day from people, and I'm pretty happy to answer any questions on subjects that I can answer. And uh, I know we, you know, we. That's a big part of what we do as staff is try and explain to the public what we're about, or if they have a question. And, and so on. So there are a lot of different ways that people can interact with the city um, and a lot of ways that we, you know, we, where we do outreach either formally through like our neighborhood meetings when we have land use decisions or, our, or like I said, the over 275 public meetings that we have every year. I mean, that's a fair amount. And, uh, uh, you know, so just thoughts. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, maybe I'll ask more questions from now on that I think I probably know the answer, but just for the sake of asking the question to get some discussion on it. I think maybe that'll help. Assuming It'll make meetings longer. Oh, yeah, and, it, and it's assuming people are watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be on for the next five weeks. They've got to <laughs> Boring them for sure. <laughs> Uh, it, remind, it reminds me of a councilman uh, years past who uh, attending meetings after I had been uh, had lost the mayor election was no longer mayor but during a meeting he got up and said to the public these meetings are just boring compared to what they used to be <laughs> now when I was mayor we got to go out and get our ambulances back we got to fire city managers we got to do all <laughs> kinds of stuff <laughs> just give me a little warning so yeah. I get the retirement papers in first <laughs> Uh, well, we don't. We don't want that kind of. Thing. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> okay. I think the important thing for tonight is that we recognize we want to look at it yep. and do yeah. as good a job as we can of getting the information out. And if any, like Rich says, if anybody's got some good suggestions, I certainly, for one, would like to hear that. Yeah. And I'm just as a personal <coughs> commitment, I'm willing to to invest some more of my time in here trying to make some of these things happen. So. Okay. 
All right. Anything else? Well, I'm, I'm wondering. Do you think uh, when we when the mayor introduces a topic, would it be good for the city manager to say a couple words about kind of introduce it also? I can think do that. Would be an idea. Subject. Yeah. Would, would that help the yeah. observing public? Yeah. All right. Um, next is business from the council and Bill. Anything? Okay, Bill. Yeah, I'm glad the uh, council uh, showed up at the uh, railroad meeting we had the other night. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to suggest that uh, at our uh, future meeting, probably the next meeting, that we adopt a resolution. Um, I, for one, would like to see the blue option adopted that they presented to us. And uh, I get the feeling of the council that the blue option where we use our station and the uh, existing UP rail and right away as the uh, preferred method of uh, increasing and uh, speeding up traffic. And I think uh, in, I in the abstract that. that's probably true. I, for one, uh, ODOT is, I think one of their next steps is to start to put the, some numbers to the options. You know, and Hustle's had some numbers out there, three billion dollars. I don't remember what the numbers were, but different options will have different numbers. And I think when the numbers become um, public, then that may influence um, choices on decisions. You know, would I like to drive a Cadillac? Well, maybe, but do I want to pay sixty thousand dollars for a car? I don't think so. So, uh, at some point, I think that's true. And really, go along with this, Dick. Um, as chair of the Albany area MPO, uh, I had a call in with Hal Broner yesterday, who is chair of Corvallis's MPO. We each have responsibility for a region dealing with regional planning. And um, I met with Roger Nyquist, who's vice chair of ours, and the, the staff from COG. We thought it was a good idea if we can get the two uh, MPOs together, because this is such a, you know, if you will, it's kind of a super regional question that it would be nice if both the MPOs could come to a common approach to provide input to ODOT. Uh, so we're going to be working through the COG staff to try to coordinate a meeting so that the two MPOs can meet and have this discussion and see if we can come to a common position. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you uh, looked at the literature they handed out. There was a green sheet that uh, asked whether you approved of the um, uh, whoever the body was that had gotten it together is, of their analysis. And then there was the other series of uh, two sheets that um, showed the analysis of the blue option, the red option, the yellow option, and the purple option. And did any of you uh, study those and, and look at the, uh, the graphical uh, results that they had come to? And they showed the blue option as being um, uh, much more cost-effective. And I, I also talked to uh, uh, Bob Melbo ab about the, the various options. Had, had a good discussion with him. And um, he, he said to me, you know, one, one of the nice things about the blue option is that you can do it piecemeal. That you get a chunk of money and you can improve a section of rail. You can double track a section of rail and get things moving faster. And, and I see that approach as having a uh, higher speed rail. Maybe even I can use it at my present age of 77. But uh, I think the other options um, I think the option was uh, signified by the size of the circle. The blue was a fairly large circle. The yellow options were little tiny circles. <laughs> which I was pleased to see. But um, uh, maybe I can encourage you to uh, study those options and then perhaps I would like to see the council, if they th so uh, feel, go on option as supporting the use of our station. Well, I certainly think a resolution as the Corvallis Council adopted a resolution based upon a petition by the citizenry and they you know, they're on record with that, and we talked about that the last couple of weeks, and what we did is ask the mayor to make sure that everybody knew what our position was. We didn't adopt a formal resolution, 
I think that would, we, I think was, that would strengthen our case yeah. if yeah. we did yeah. adopt a resolution. So you just gave direction for yeah. me to convey our council's support for yeah. the UP line. I think that's oh, right. Okay, was it just a yeah. motion? I yeah, think we it was just a motion for yeah. Yeah. No. Tell, no. Tell her to go speak our piece. Right. And I did to to the extent meeting. that a resolution carries any weight, I would agree with Dick. Mm -hmm. okay. can, yeah. you know, I have a consensus of the council that we prepare a resolution for our consideration to that effect. Yeah. I think it does absolutely no harm to have it on there. I don't know how much good it does, well, but it so does no I, harm. I agree completely, but I think uh, every, you never know. Okay. Every, every little hair you can add to the so straw you can add to the camel's back. Uh, can do some good. Right. So. December 17th is our next leadership council meeting, and they pretty much want to secure where the, the routes are going to be, you know, looking at those alternatives for that meeting so they can really when start. When is that going to occur? Um, December 17th will be yeah, that we meeting. Have a council meeting before that? Yeah, hmm. we do. Um, we have one on December 4th. Okay. So and I think I'm on, on their subgroup, which I believe is. December 4th, so I think I'll have more information at that meeting, too. Like I said, I had a good discussion with Bob Melbo, and, and I, I was uh, pointing out to him that <coughs> Albany has been working on uh, rail connections for a long time. I said, uh, when SP went out of the passenger business in 1971, we didn't have any train that stopped here uh, <coughs> for a while. And... Uh, uh, not until uh, I said uh, uh, 77 or 78. Oh, no, he said, the, the, the train has always stopped in Albany. And I said, well, I'll, I'll bet you a beer on that. And I knew I was right because I'd just been looking through some of my clippings. Well, then the guy who's in charge of the, uh, the loop bus, or, or he, he's on the committee for the loop bus. Lowry? Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I think that's the name. Mm -hmm. He came up and uh, a knowledgeable sort of guy. And Melbo said, the train's always stopped in Albany, hasn't it? Well, no, he said, it, it quit in 71, which is what I had said, but it started again in 73. I said, well, I'll bet you a beer, too. <laughs> it's, I don't know if they'll ever pay off, but I know I'm right. So. Don't collect both of them in one night. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, you go ahead and collect them, just don't drive <laughs> afterwards. Exactly. Well, there's no place to go, I guess, too bad. <laughs> Okay. So, so it was a good meeting, I thought. Okay. So you want a resolution then brought back for the next <laughs> meeting, like December? That. The okay. Feels that's uh, appropriate. Who would draft that? We can, we can, mm -hmm. I'm sure we can. Staff. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the statements, and typically the resolution has lots of whereas, is, but one of them should, to four, or so several of them should address the fact that we do have this multimodal transportation state. I mean, every time I go by there, I'm very impressed with how yeah. busy it is. I don't know if it's train. There's a couple different buses. Some people might use it for park and ride. There's a bunch of cars there. But oh, no. to, to my knowledge, Corvallis doesn't have a facility no. at all. And I don't know that that's even been addressed. Uh, has it? I mean, I, yeah. they're they jumping up and down for the train, but what are the, what's their plan? They, they have, have to build a new station. Well, yeah. and Absent of numbers, you know, and the suggestion I was talking to some of the people from ODOT and some other people in the audience on Thursday night is once the numbers are there, and, and I don't know what they are currently, but just to say that to bring, to bring the track from Harrisburg up to, through Corvallis is $500 million. Pick the number, whatever they come up with. Contrast that versus how much it would cost to improve commuter service, bus service from Corvallis to here that coincides with the timing of the train to stop and, and run a present worth analysis on that and see where the numbers are. My initial thought is it's going to be so far on, the, on favor of supplementing and getting the passengers over to an existing facility than building 40 miles of brand new track and crossing at least three if not four rivers. Having a lot of property in the and, meantime. And my understanding is there isn't right away over there. So then you face the political issue of putting new track right through EFU land, which Oregonians are not real high on chewing up EFU lands. So you know, I think all the cards have to be on the table, and then you can properly evaluate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is that it, Dick? Um, yeah. Okay. All right, Rich. Um, transient lodging tax. Uh-huh. I'm I'm happy to see it's going up. Yeah. I guess is the the number of rooms 
um, within the within the data collection system, uh, the number of rooms uh, that make this number available. Um, right. No. Or About how we could collect that information. Well, we I'm just I was now. just thinking in terms of um, <coughs> if it goes up by X number, ten percent, whatever it is. Um, did they raise the rates by 10%, so we're now getting a chunk of a bigger number, or are we actually getting more people? Uh, it's nice that we're getting more, more money, but it would be even nicer if that meant that we were getting more people that would then use more restaurants, that would then use more fuel, yada, 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 yada. Uh, that it's a little of both, um, but I don't think there's any question that the rooms you know, I mean, the, the number of rooms rented are, is increasing. We've been seeing but that. I'd like to see the number if, if it's easily available. Is it a if fixed fee or a percentage that they it's pay? It's a percentage that we, oh, okay. that we get, and, um, and we, can, we can sure try. I mean, we could probably just do an informal survey of, of the hotels, too. Because and, and, they're, I mean, we, in the past, we have audited. Um, you know, we, in fact, I think every year we select. Right one or two hotels to actually audit, um, but I'm sure we can get that information pretty easily. It is great to see how much our revenues and tourism and everybody working together to increase, you know, on our tourism dollars and where we're at. It's very positive for Albany. And, um, and you know, some of the word with the hotelers is we're going to be faced with the lack of bed space, you know, for Albany if, you know, we keep on you know, bringing up the numbers within our tourism. But we thought, you know what, that's a good problem then. So if it looks like we're going to end up needing another hotel in the future, we can, that'll be a good problem to have. But um, it is wonderful of everybody working hard to bring in those tourism dollars. And boy, the numbers are sure showing it. So yeah, so it's better than what we were looking at back in, was it 07 when it dropped way down and <laughs> you know, with the economy and boy, we were really scrambling. So, so no, it looks great. Okay, anything else, Rich? No. Okay, Ray. I'm good. Okay, Floyd. No, thank you. Okay, and I didn't have anything this evening. And Wes. We have something on the dais, the chief. Oh, yeah. <laughs> chief Bradner has something for us. But oh, but I'm supposed to present it for him because he's sitting at the back of the room. Oh, no, doesn't want to come up. <laughs> and he's saying no, no, no. Yeah. Um, we had mentioned to you um, uh, a catch that had occurred in the purchase of the property. Um, uh, at 531 Lyon Street, this is the, I believe Marshall property was the name of it, um, that they had a lease with a tenant that was not going to expire uh, uh, for a number of years. And uh, as Chief Bradner explains in his memo, we can basically buy out that lease for $20,000. And um, um, it we felt this was sort of within the boundaries of closing costs, but I felt it was important for the council to list, at least be aware of it, that it is an additional price in order for us to be, you had, as he, had, um, the council had offered, uh, had said that we could enter into a purchase uh, agreement for a sum not to exceed 625000 um, This would add an additional $20,000 to that total cost. And um, again, just wanted to make the council aware of it, and if there was a problem with it, for you to let us know now. So that, but, but I believe, and I don't want to speak for Jim, uh, but I believe he felt this was a pretty um, reasonable uh, conclusion to what could have been a much bigger liability. Oh, it is, and for the council's information, we're not doing anything to uh, move out tenants or trying to discourage anyone from staying, but if we acquire property, and the property has a long-term lease, and we want to preserve the ability to say to those tenants, you guys have to move out so that we can build a fire station if the voters approve the funding, um, then we have to be prepared to pay a substantial cost for their relocation, for their uh, the difference in what they're paying in rent at their current location compared to a comparable new location and so forth. And in doing the preliminary math, we think that this compromise settlement is very reasonable. Um, your alternative is to condemn a lease, which is the same process essentially you go through to condemn property, and it's seldom uh, a
financially efficient exercise for government. Question? Um, since their, their lease doesn't expire in two, until 2019, and we don't know what the future action is going to be by the community, the voters, is there any, is there a way to have a discussion with them that, you know, there's a 12-month notification period and that number would change? We've had those discussions. I think John has made it very clear to them that we have not purchased the property. We have no intention of moving them out, we, that there would be plenty of advanced lead time. We have done everything we can to essentially encourage them to stay. I think that's correct. Ray then Rich. Mm -hmm. And I'm inferring then from that your comment that uh, they're, they're just, they'd just be happy here to pull the plug and, and, and move on their own rather than staying there and paying the city rent or whatever. <coughs> That appears to be the case. I don't think we can speculate really on why they are choosing to take the course of action they are. I, we don't know. It's not anything that we are doing. Rich? Is this a local or is this the national group? We can't. The, the lease is with the national, but we can't know who is the driving factor, whether it's local managers wanting to move or whether it's a national decision. We, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments, Chief? Okay. Basically, if the council has no objection, this is the direction we would go. So do you need us to formally authorize it or just work on it? You actually authorized the purchase we were considering as part of the closing cost, but we wanted to disclose it since it's a little higher. Than there are always some incidental expenses we can't completely anticipate when we're doing projects of this scale. And this is one of those, but because, because we have time, given the decision of the voters, um, we brought it to you so that there are no surprises. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, any other items? No. Staff? Have anything? Okay. There is a work session on Monday. Um, yeah, work session November 18th, and then we have regular session would be December 4th. So. Monday, Monday. Assuming no council objection, uh, that is my wedding anniversary on Monday, and I promised my wife an evening of my time. So okay. I, I will not be here. For bring her along. Good. Pardon? Take her out. Just bring her down nice here. Dinner. I want to hit 42. Yeah. <laughs> Marilyn, would you tell nice us the, the December schedule again, please? We have a work session on, I'm going by memory here, work session on November 18th, or November 18th, council meeting on December 4th, city hall open house on December 2nd, Monday, December 2nd. Um, work session and hang on. I think uh, council uh, meeting on the Consult my electronic ring there. We have Is another meeting December 11th. 11th, thank you. Okay. And there is not a works another work session in December just the one on and we do have Kara next week meetings. yeah Four Kara next November. week and do we have Kara in December I don't know the answer I do not believe we okay okay all right it's the Monday meeting uh, gonna be a heavy duty in the last clear of six you know do you think or? that would be up to Mr. Shepard I think what's that Monday meeting on, on the 18th on the added agenda. You think you're going to keep us clear till six, or can we get out a little earlier? Um, we're going to be bringing to you a report on uh, water rates. So that's um, in my presentation is probably no more than 15 minutes. Um, and so. uh, Jorge Salinas will have a report right. on um, <laughs> IT projects <laughs> that are. That's how many questions that right. That's and that that report is the the one that the council had requested on sort of the staging of software purchases and that sort of thing. So. Anything else? Okay. With that, we are adjourned.